teach and I work as a, as a researcher in the field of psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics. Um, my narrow area of expertise is actually language of already adult people. Uh, so adult typical functioning language, I mostly work on sentence processing, but uh, language acquisition is something that is, uh, is a psycholinguistic topic, let's say the most interesting one, uh, the one that uh, people want to hear about, the one that is always rewarding to do research on because it's so applicable and it's so important for the society. Um, it is very interesting, and as you will see, the most interesting part is that we still only have theories, <laughs> and we don't know exactly what is happening um, uh, in terms of, you know, saying for sure what is happening to our brains when we acquire language, but I will try in this topic to cover the mo two most um, prevailing approaches to um, and most theories to, you know, language acquisition and what we think is happening, actually. So I can start if that is okay. I don't know if we want to wait for some people to join or... You are set and ready to go to start. Uh, perfect. So this is why, the, the reason why I uh, named the, the lecture Acquiring Not Learning Language is because this is a very important distinction and understanding what acquiring language means uh, as opposed to learning language is actually the core of the topic, right? So um, what I will be talking about is language acquisition characteristics, just a bit uh, given uh, uh, over, uh, over outline. And I will be talking also about the stages uh, of language acquisition, and then we'll talk about the approaches. So as I said, it is very important in the beginning to distinguish between language acquisition and language learning. Language acquisition refers to the unconscious, uh, many would say intuitive process or that is automatic, meaning that we're not thinking about it. The process by which humans, usually the babies, right? acquire the language, acquire this capacity to perceive, comprehend, and produce language, right? Uh, we'll talk about the capacity thing. Now, language, so this is acquisition. You acquire the language. It is not something that you do effortfully, right? You are like a, a sponge that soaks in all the information, right? I said mostly unconscious because some things are definitely conscious, especially when children later became become aware of the language. Whereas language learning refers to mostly conscious, effortful process. Typical example here of language learning is, you know, me starting to learn Slovenian <laughs> last year. Uh, this is a very effortful process. Um, I have to think about the rules. I have to think about what I'm going to say, the application of the rules, I have to think about my knowledge when I am applying my knowledge, right? Whereas with our native languages, the languages we learn as babies, you know, from birth, this is effortful. We don't think about, and often, you know, not all of us who speak our native languages know about the grammar rules and stuff like that. We don't have to know about them. We just acquire rules automatically, without thinking about it. This is why, you know, in order to know something formally about your native language, maybe in school you will learn about it. But when you ask an eight year old, you know, uh, what is the word order of your language? Or uh, do you have ac accusative case in your language? They don't know because they just acquired it, but they use it perfectly by the age of eight, right? Even by the age of six. Um, now, language acquisition is quick, it's relatively quick for a system that is so complex, uh, for some things, a type of knowledge that is so layered, this is a very quick process. It is easy uh, and without formal teaching, right? Obviously, the parents do give some instructions. They would say, you don't say it like that, you say it like that, right? These corrections is something that is, mm, let's say not acquisition, but rather learning. This is why I said it's mostly unconscious. Uh, but this happens automatically, whether their parents are trying to teach them or not. So a kid that, you know, who has a parent who is a little bit more engaged and say, oh, you learn it like this, you learn it like that. 
and the other parent that is not so engaged in the process of learning but simply talks talks to the child uh, the the two kids will acquire their their native language perfectly maybe in the first kid you will a little bit uh let's say um develop the, uh, the the metalinguistic curiosity yes but acquiring to speak your own language in both scenarios it will be the same right uh the important thing in language acquisition is interaction it is very important that the children in their first years are exposed to language this exposure is a very important thing right through interaction, and this is very important, right? So it's important that the kids, and this is something that we were talking before we started the lecture, so not watching TV, right? But talking to another human being, um, we will come back later to why language is so socially dependent, right? It is important that the kids interact with their parents, with other adults, but also at some point when they maybe start kindergarten or something with other children, this peer contact is also very important, right? Um, there are, uh, this is, this, there, there is research uh, on various topics uh, when it comes to this human interaction, why it is important. Even looking at the face uh, is really important. Here I'm talking about, you know, verbal language. I'm not talking about sign language, Sign language is even it's even uh, more important maybe, but it is very important for the kids to have this information and interaction with with their parents or the other adults because they are actually doing a lot of integration of the audio visual information and we even have in the last couple of years we even have some interesting studies that show a slight delay in some of the aspects of course later everything will probably be picked up but they show a slight delay in some aspects of the language acquisition due to children looking at the at the faces with a mask due to corona. So mask even had some impact because the children couldn't see the mouths of people interacting to them and maybe the faces were weird. <laughs> so this, uh, so, inter so learning a language is not just listening, it's also the interaction, it's the emotional moment and it is the audiovisual integration. Uh, another very important aspect is the so-called baby talk or motherese, motherese being the, the 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 slang for the language of the mothers, obviously, but obviously parents and caregivers in general, the way in which we talk to children, you know, when we when we exaggerate, we increase our pitch, we cha we, we use a very dramatic changes in the intonation, we do a lot of repetition, and we sort of simplify what we are talking. Although some people think that this is maybe bad for some reason, but actually, especially the intonation part and the repetition, research has shown is helping kids acquire language. Why? Because what when you think about what language comprehension is in speech, you have a string, a string of sounds and you have to detect the words and to chunk words and to chunk sounds and to chunk syllables and then to realize okay these are separate separate words in this string of speech that i'm hearing motheries uh, and baby talk are actually helping children segment the speech sound uh, which is then helping them um, acquire language right because learning language is not just learning meanings of the words they have to do so many things it's a speech single it's auditory task it's 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 a lot of things i will talk about the stages now so mother ease is actually this very expressive talk is a good thing this is how we should talk to children and you know making faces and you know making our eyes wide and everything this these are all cues that help children segment language so they're very helpful so this is just to say how interaction is important. Now, language acquisition, it, this is what research is more or less clear on, right? There are some things we know for sure. <laughs> um, research is more or less clear on uh, the, the general stages of language acquisition. 
uh, these are called the milestones, right, that the child reaches. Now, some children acquire language earlier than the others. This is completely normal. Um, and there are many factors for that, right? Um, however, what is shown is that all children usually follow the same steps. Some people go through the steps quickly and, you know, don't talk until they're three. And then at the age of three, they just like in three months, they start, you know, talking in sentences. Some people, some children start really uh, early and then they go through stages, they take their time, etc. Uh, some children maybe can skip a stage or have it really shortly. But in general, these are the stages. First one um, is the pre-linguistic stage. And this already starts, you know, from birth. This is before any syllables are made. And at this point, when the child is born, the first six months or so, uh, the baby is just playing with the, with the speech apparatus, right? Making some vowel sounds. I, it's usually always the same sounds, usually the, something like ah, that's easier, that's much easier than, let's say, u. <laughs> it's simply easier to pronounce. It is very interesting. I will go, I will skip this part now just to show you that at this pre linguistic stage, and this has to do with actually even the origin, origins of language. Uh, the uh, the speech apparatus the in human infant, if you see in the lower part, is not yet fully developed, right? If you compare the soft palate part and the epiglottis part, it is much lower than in comparison to the to the adult human who has a lot more space. Also, in in human infants, the tongue is taking a lot of space in the mouth. Uh, they don't control the 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 the, 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 the muscle, um, and they don't control the nasal cavity and the air that is going through it. These are all things that you know. Uh, let's say the human infant is a little bit uh, cl uh, is not yet fully developed, and these are all prerequisites to speak. So what the child needs to wait for first is for the speech apparatus to be fully ready for speech. This is usually around uh, uh, six of, uh, months of age. And this is the so-called babbling stage when the kids are very cute. This is when they start making um, syllables. Strings usually, almost always, is a consonant. So consonants such as k, p, b, d, t together with a vowel such as a, e, and then they combine them to get something like bu, da, etc. Usually first is only one syllable and the child is playing around combining them. And this is the part where we get the ba, ba, mama, dada stage, at which point some parents say like, ah, oh, she, my kid said mama or dada. No, they did not call. <laughs> at six months, they probably don't know what it means. There is no meaning to these strings of, of syllables. At this point, the kids are just playing with the language, uh, doing ba, ba, dada, mommy, stuff like that. Um, to see what they can do with their with their uh, vocal apparatus, right? So this is the babbling stage around six months. Now the first words that that is let's say the actual beginning of of speech with meaning usually happen around the age of one. Of course, as I said, this is th th there's a lot of variation. Uh, but this is when the child actually connects that something. At this point, the child is already baba dada mim, already you know, familiar with the with these strings of words. But then the child is attaching some meaning to it, at around the first four days. So so uh, the child will now know that mommy is referring to the person, right? That is mom. Uh, these will still be very simple words to pronounce. Um, and this is when the actual language starts, right? Then we get to the two word stage around the age of two. Between one and two, of course, a lot of trying out is happening. The child is actually learning to connect concepts to something that they are pronouncing. And then they are starting to put two words together and start making sentences, right? Something like doggy, run, 
um, me, water, right? Stuff like that. Um, and this two word stage can last for quite a long time and then can kind of be um, developed into something that we call telegraphic stage. Uh, something like big doggy run fast, right? And stuff like that. At this point, the child is still using things that are relatively easy to pronounce, but then the child will later, you know, like two, three, start, you know, pronouncing consonant clusters such as in street um, more and more, right? Then the child will add. By this point, the child has mostly used something that we call content words. So the words that have some kind of uh, concept behind them, such as doggy, which is a noun, run, which is a verb, etc. But then the child will start using things like articles, function words, auxiliaries, um, more complex, uh, such as using passive or past tense. Uh, this will happen afterwards. Um, and the more complex sound combinations, such as I said. And then by the age of five or six or kindergarten, usually, this is a typical, of course, um, a typical situation from, you know, uh, uh, usually, you know, a, a Western setting, um, the child will have, where this research is usually coming from, the child will by this age have acquired the vast majority of language and the rules, and the rest is just, you know, combination, because the language is a very creative process. Um, and at that point, the child is just combining what the child already knows. At this point, five, six... Oh, Yana, can, <clears throat> can I ask yes. a question about that? Yes. When you say what the child already knows, at, yeah. what's, at what age does a child understand full sentences without being able to speak them? Oh, this is much, much, much earlier. Uh, already probably, I mean, already probably at the age of, you know, two, at the two word stage, the child already makes doggy run kind of statements. But you from the beginning talk to the child in full sentences, right? So the question is only, you know, that's the difference between comprehension and production. So the question is, you know, the, the, the kid kind of is a, a able to extract the information from your full sentences, but we already by the age of, you know, like two, probably the child is understanding more or less all the parts, but not sure how to use them. <laughs> so then later, you know, you know, these function words such as the articles and stuff like that, the, the child notices already probably, you know, it's two. Uh, that there is something, but not sure what it does or, you know, how to use them. So this is why it's coming later in production, but they can understand full sentences very early on. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. That's a good point because I've been talking about production the whole time, but of course there's a comprehension. Uh, and of course, when we talk to the children, we are using a lot of extra linguistic information too. Uh, we use our hands, we use our body language, we use the intonation that I was mentioning. So I think that children, even though if, if they don't know exactly what the article does, they extract the rule that it always comes before the noun. So it's probably some kind of noun addition, uh, right? So they can extract a lot of rules themselves uh, but until they actually use them, they're not sure what it is. Uh, okay, so this is more or less, as I said, by five or six. And, and at, this po at this stage, very cute things are happening because children are now um, aware of the rules of the language. In the end, language is a system of rules. So at this point, children do overcorrections, and they would, for example, in English, it's very cute because this is when the children will say, foot instead of feet, right? Because they know that you build plural by adding S to the noun in singular, and then you have to actually correct them. No, no, no. But this is very a, a good sign. This is a sign of learning that the child has learned the rule and is now applying it to every new word. Uh, and then you have to read uh, to learn the exceptions. This is when, you know, when the children start school, this is when they start learning exceptions. Um, okay. Uh, now, I've been talking about um, a, a monolingual language acquisition. I would just quickly like to m mention uh, that actually more and more, actually, 
probably a vast, vast majority uh, of situations right now is to some extent multilingual, right? Uh, and this is a topic that is very important in multilingual societies uh, because it determines very often. I, I I lived and worked a lot in the Basque country, which is a which is a, a, a bilingual society, and they would consult a psycholinguist on these topics. You know, they would want to see some research to know, hey, uh, does acquiring two languages confuse the kids? How shall we adapt the education system, etc.? And this is actually a myth. <laughs> the child is not confused. Uh, there is research that shows that children go through all these milestones that I now described um, when they're acquiring multiple languages. Now, there is a lot of variability in how they get to where they get, right? So let's say by the age of six in kindergarten, they will have acquired probably the two languages. Say one parent is talking one language, the other parent is talking another. One of them is the language of the environment, or maybe the language of the environment is the third one. There are a lot of factors there, but if the child receives enough interaction, right, in all the languages, it will go through all the milestones uh, and acquire all the languages, right? And, you know, more languages, more richness, and it's better, it's always better. So I, I think that there is, a, there is a myth that, you know, this will confuse the child, speak only in one language, and then the child will start learning another one. Maybe they will need a little bit more time simply because imagine learning vocabulary of one language and then having two or three simply they have a, a bigger inventory to cover, right? So they might take more time to reach the milestones, but or maybe a bit a little bit quicker in one language or another because they interact more in that language. But in principle, they will, um, this is what the research shows, they will reach all the milestones and they will acquire language unless they don't have enough uh, interaction, enough input which is then not really a typical multilingual uh, setting. Um, okay, so, so another important thing that I will be talking about here is why language acquisition is also different from learning is because we believe that language acquisition um, uh, relates to something that we learn in the first years of life. And first years of life are crucial. And here we come to the point of what our brain is doing in the meantime, right? Um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, the researchers have proposed something called the critical period hypothesis uh, that states that the first years of, of life are crucial time. I said few because actually we don't know. <laughs> how, you know, some they first said four, but it's actually probably a longer period. Um, but these first years of life a crucial time for an individual to acquire a first language or first languages, right? But now I'm not talking about, you know, learning German when you're 20. But these first languages to, to, to have their native language or net languages, it has to happen within a certain time window, right? From birth. Um, and it has been shown that if language input through interaction does not occur until this time, until this time window, the individual will never learn a language. And unfortunately, we have cases of feral children, so-called feral children. Those are the children that are due to some uh, unfortunate consequences have been isolated in, from their infancy, um, either brought up in the wild or kept in isolation or confinement. Uh, and these cases, you know, that's very unfortunate, but these some of these cases have been useful for science, actually. The most common uh, and the most well-known cases are the girl called Jeannie uh, that was kept in confinement by her parents in a room uh, from birth until she was 13. Uh, when she was found, it was found that she doesn't have many cognitive impairments, that she's cognitively okay, but she was never even you know, to, after seven years of training, specialized training, she was never able to acquire language. The other case is the girl Isabel, who was confined until she was six and a half. And at the age of six and a half, she started learning language and she managed to master the language completely. 
uh, which is why people believe that the critical period probably ends somewhere around the age of seven uh, or so, and it doesn't stop abruptly, but it like significantly increases, right? Now, this idea of the critical period does not come from language, it comes from other system of biology. Um, for example, there, there is a, the idea of critical period for the visual system development. Also, if by a certain period you don't get visual input, uh, your visual system won't uh, develop. And it has to do, of course, with your brain development uh, and what the brain development does. There is something that is called brain plasticity, um, which is basically a general idea of some because the information in our brain is working in such a way that the connection called synapses are being made from one cell to another. And this is how we learn things. This is how we know things. This is how things are in, uh, uh, communicated through our brain. Uh, and uh, it looks like this is happening much more during the critical period. In the first years of life, the brain is developing still, experiencing very explosive growth. A lot of myelination is happening, which is very important. Now, myelin are the so-called coating of these synapses. I have it here uh, in the picture. This is our brain. Uh, this is our white matter of the brain. The myelin is actually white matter, right? Um, and it looks like in the first years of life, especially the first two years, it's happening a lot. And it's not just that you are creating connections that you will need, but also kind of losing those that you don't develop. So if in, in the first years, why the brain is kind of, this is kind of the, the, the calibration of your brain for what you will be using in your life, right? Um, and if you don't have language inputs in those first several years, it seems that you will never be able to uh, acquire language completely. Um, so, okay, there are two approaches. I will now move to the approaches um, to the knowing all this, the critical period hypothesis and then the stages. There are two general approaches to the, to the language acquisition. Uh, one is the nativist. I don't know if you recognize this gentleman on the <laughs> on the left. Uh, Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky, exactly. Uh, uh, and this is this is Chomsky, and this is Skinner, who is also a, a famous psychologist. And this is sort of a battle thing happening. It's one of these hot topics in psychology and language. The battle still persists. I will tell you later, you know, where we are currently. But it started already in the 50s, 60s, uh, the battle between whether language is something that is native, something that you know, you get born with and you don't have to work on it a lot because you're born with it, or you actually have to work on it and it depends on your environment, which is what the, the behavioralists are claiming. Now, Chomsky um, is a person who in the 60s basically invented the, uh, the, 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 the linguistics as we know it nowadays. Uh, maybe he is more, he had a lot of impact on certain areas of psychology, such as this one. Um, but nowadays, he's maybe more known as an activist and um, a, a, a critic of, of, of capitalism and uh, a lot of things about the modern society. But he is actually a linguist uh, from MIT. I think he's there in Arizona now. He's still uh, alive, 95, and still uh, doing a lot of work, important and influential work. So the idea that nativists following Chomsky uh, suggested in the 60s is that the the humans are born with this instinct or the in, or the innate facility or capacity for acquiring language. That means that um, they even suggested something, some sort of brain structure that is called the language acquisition device, the LAD. At this point, this is 1965, we don't have fancy brain scanning techniques, right? Um, that is allowing humans to speak, to acquire language, actually. Um, and that the environmental factors are actually relatively unimportant for language emergence, right? Um, sorry. B Biana, can, can you describe what are environmental factors? Is it would be like television or what? 
the interaction with people, anything, right? So being exposed to language is even an environmental factor, right? So even the language input that you're listening that by now, because I gave you some intro, we know is very important, but this theory claims that this has little to do, right? Um, they, this theory claims that language learners possess this principle and they will learn the language even with a minimal input. I will mention it now, right? So environmental factors such as uh, talking to other people, um, other things such as socializing, uh, living in a nurturing environment, looking at people's faces while they're talking. Also TV, this is also a part of input. Me, maybe being read to. All these are not so important, such as having this innate ability, probably uh, uh, enabled through a part of your a structure in your brain called language acquisition device. This has more to do with linguistics, not so language acquisition, but they also propose a certain idea of universal grammar. Some, some people are, are still working on this topic, uh, which basically is kind of, it's a different idea trying to say that all languages of the world, because we're all humans with a language acquisition device, that means that all languages of the world will have certain uh, general universal grammar that is then tweaked according to your environment, according to the language. Is this basically saying that there's an innate ability to understand things in our own way and express things in our own way? Uh, not in our own way, in a universal way, right? What so does that, that mean? That we are born with the ability to speak, that the speech, to speak and understand language, that the language that we speak, there are some universal principles across the globe for all the languages, but then it kind of the core of the language, right? Say, uh, all languages have vowels, all languages have subjects, all languages, you know, stuff like that. This is just a theory but then you tweak them according to your own language, such as the actual pronunciation, the labels that you put on concepts are something that depends on your country. You know, water is called water in English, but agua in Spanish, etc. cetera. Um, this is the idea. Some people work on it. I just have to say that since that, I'm not Chomsky, but since then, we don't have a lot of evidence about this universal grammar principles because language is so different. And it's so hard to claim that this is true. Uh, he, they also claimed that this poverty of the stimulus, what this means is that, well, the languages are innate. We have language acquisition device. It's not so important how much input we get because they claim children actually get really not enough data in comparison to how richly they speak by the age of four or six, right? Um, so it's not like every word that they learn in, in the form that they pronounce it, every sentence they've already heard, right? So again, this is now considered controversial. We think that children are actually receiving a lot of input uh, in different ways. Uh, but it is true uh, that children, when we speak, we are very creative. So it is not true that in order to learn something, we have to have heard it previously or interacted in that way. We do a lot of uh, um, projections. We do a lot of creativity. And this is, th this is one argument um, that the gen generativists still hold, that we can produce theoretically and immeasurable, uncountable number of sentences based on the limited knowledge we have, right? Uh, but uh, as I said, the other approach is the behavioralist approach uh, coming from Skinner mostly. And it's kind of, at some point it became a, a, a debate between the linguists following Chomsky and psychologists following Skinner. Uh, hopefully nowadays we're gonna find a middle ground. Uh, but it says that the child actually imitates the language from its surrounding, right? Uh, as you can see, the nativists are more talking about what a child can do without being explicitly told to, whereas the behavioralists are saying that we that they are just actually imitating what they're seeing, right? And they're saying that the humans learn language through seeing and hearing and the system of reward and punishment. Um, 
they are uh they must have an emotional link to the parent or the person that they are interacting to uh and these pleasant feelings while they're imitating are how they learn a language and they're also claiming that there is no difference between a language and any other information or learning whereas the nativists are saying basically that the language is special because of this language acquisition device um and they are the behavioralists are saying that 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 this is because you're constantly learning and creating new connections you you are actually you can learn at any point but then uh when it comes to the question of why do children and how will we explain this uh critical period hypothesis um they are saying well it's not that the children do not just acquire language these feral children that are past the critical period it's not just that they are uh, not acquiring the language they are deprived of many other they're deprived of nurturing environment right so the la the lack of language acquisition in the cases of girls such as genie might come not just because the language is special but because they didn't have other factors that are important, uh, such as interactions, such as generally being in an abusive environment, etc. Right. So as you can see, both sides have some good arguments and some arguments that are kind of hard to explain. Right. Um, but the question now comes: What we have in the last decades is neuroscientific uh, and neuroimaging um, evidence. So do we have a language acquisition device? Actually, in the first years of, of language research, we have believed for a while that there are certain several structures in the brain in the left hemisphere, the Broca's area in the, in the frontal area, uh, the Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe, and the arcuate fasciculus, which is the bundle of, of white matter pathways connecting them. And that was believed to be the, you know, the structure that is responsible for language. But now, after decades of research, we know that there are so many areas, as you can see on this picture, this is the left hemisphere. There are some areas in the right hemisphere, although language is predominantly left, left uh, lateralized. But we know that there are so many areas. And the important thing is that none of these areas is specifically for language. Uh, depending on the experiment, depending on the task, we know that some of them are more specialized for language, such as these Broca and Wernicke's. But other things, they, they might be doing some other things, such as problem solving um, or some kind of general task related uh, uh, um, uh, functions. So based on the evidence, we have really little data to confirm that there is something like in uh, something in something like inborn language acquisition device or a part of the brain that is only and exclusively um, uh, used, you know, serves uh, to acquire a language. Um, so while, to conclude, while I think it is true that there is something special about, and we still don't know why, so this is why, you know, Chomsky and uh, a theory is still alive to some extent, we still don't know why, language is so easy for children to acquire uh, definitely there is something uh, that has to do with the critical period hypothesis but also definitely interaction and environmental factors such as other people and the input are very very important so actually the 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 answer is probably somewhere in between, as it usually goes with these debates, right? Uh, the important and another approach is called the interactionist approach that is actually underlining this interaction. But this approach is actually taking both the biological factors that are more important for the uh, nativist uh, debate and the behavioralist uh, factors that are more important for the for the for the, for the nurture debate, right? So. I think it's both of these things. I think it's not good to be extreme in any of it. But what we know now from research is uh, probably picking up from both of these approaches to, you know, um, to, to, to find out what's actually happening. So this is all for, for, for me for now. And thank you for your